So uh, welcome to part two of our guide to the Silmarillion. And Jacob is still with me to talk about what exactly there is in the covers of this book, which you may have on your shelf, but not yet have got all the way through. So the second age is now becoming much more familiar to all of us, thanks to the Amazon Prime series. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what the Ancalabeth is about? Because we've moved completely away from the elves, don't we? And it's a real change. Right, of scene. exactly. Yeah, and this and this one really is is different. And you mentioned this in the uh, last episode that it's a, a kind of a different, separate story. So the 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 Quintus Silmarillion ends with the end of the of, of the first age, really, right? So the Silmarils are, are 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 gone, are no longer part of it, and it's not the children of Feanor kind of driving things now. You have uh, men, which aren't just exclusively male, right? So that's this catch-all term for humanity. Um, and they become much larger players here. Uh, and the so this is the section, this uh, Akalabeth, uh, is a, literally, it means the down, the downfalling. Um, and it's the downfall, the subtitle that, that Julia shared earlier was, uh, the right, it's the, the fall of, of Numenor, right? Um, so it's a downfall in, and it's the this world, this well, this this land, right? So at the end of the first age, um, there were part of the factions of men were kind of helpers of the elves in their war against Melkor, renamed Morgoth, um, and they were as kind of a reward, they were given a land of their own, uh, this island uh, called Numenor. Right. And uh, it's it has ties, you know, you, you see resonances with uh, Atlantis um, myths. Uh, and actually, you know, the uh, one of the words for Numenor uh, is related to Atlantis in, in Elvish. But they get a different etymology that, that Tolkien kind of brings in there. Um, so that's this, it's, a, it's a gift. It's put kind of partway between the shores of Middle Earth. And Valinor, the lands of the the Valar, the the gods. Um, so it's kind of this halfway place. They can, you know, just see how great it is, but they're still tied there. Um, the, because the part of the, this is something that you'll you'll read uh, with the Aino Lindale, Valaquinta, and when the men are coming onto the scene, is that the fate of men are different from the fate of elves. So the elves can live in you know this state of like bliss in the presence of the gods until the end of the world, but humans have a different fate. They are not meant to live for ages and ages in happiness. They have a different fate and, and they're kind of a, a people apart. They're referred to by the elves kind of as the, the strangers uh, that, that they've, that, that nobody, even, even the, the Valar don't know exactly what happens to men after they die. They know what happens to elves. They're all tied up with in the same world. But but men are these kind of strangers on the scene that only the, the high god Iluvatar knows what they're all about and what will happen to them afterwards. But they have a, a, an enormous impact here on the world. Um, and so the Akalabeth is essentially this following this, this land, this Numenor, this kind of Atlantis-like land, and this kind of rise and then fall uh, of these people. Um, and of course, and this is the period that the Amazon uh, Rings of Power is is really set in. And you see that that's what we're going to be following here is the kind of the the grandeur of the kingdom of of men here in Numenor, and then how that all goes wrong. Yeah. So um, I mentioned in my podcast before the the, the uh, series came out that they're bringing tomb key events into parallel so the making of the rings happens in around 1600 which is the equivalent of Tudor times uh in the second age and the downfall of Numenor is in 3700 and something you know so it's like Star Trek uh, period way into the future from us um but in order to make the sense of a story and have connecting characters they're bringing them uh in parallel um so what they won't have time to do is show the the succession of kings of Numenor, an occasional queen, um, 
And in fact, it's told in quite a summary form in the Silmarillion as well. There's much more detail, I think, in um, particularly in the Unfinished Tales. There's, there's much more about Numenor. Yeah. Um, but it does spend a fair bit of time at the last king, who's this person called R. Farazon, who is not good news. Um, he's, he's a bit like a sort of... Uh, he reminds me a bit like um, the Pharaoh figure. I mean, his name suggests that <clears throat> to a certain extent. He's sort of got pre his pretensions and he wishes to. Um, he's, he's the one who falls because Sauron is there as a sort of glamorous tempter and tells him, oh, you can go into the West. You know, why do you, you don't have to stay? And so he, he's like biting the tree of the fruit of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. He, he sets sail. And of course, that means that there's a kind of slap bag doesn't seem quite the right word. Yeah. There's a punishment that that unleashes, and that is why Numenor um, sinks beneath the waves. Um, you may remember, just to kind of be really geeky about this, that in the films, Erwin talks about a dream of a tidal wave coming over the land. That is linking to Numenor. Um, that image of the the island that sinks, but out of the wreck comes the ones who remain true and are friends to the elves, and I'm sure this is going to feature largely in the uh, Amazon series. This is Elendil and his sons uh, Isildur and what's the other one? Uh, I'll come back to him anyway. Isildur and Elendil are the two key guys. Um, and they uh, they set up kingdoms, the North and South Kingdoms in Middle-earth, which leads us into the Third Age. So that, in, in brief, is what happens to Numenor. So the Ancalabeth tells that story. And then the final section of the Silmarillion is called... Um, of the Rings of Power and the Third Age. So this actually involves quite a lot of Second Age material, the Rings of Power stuff, as well as how it connects to the Third Age. So if you're wanting just to understand the material behind Lord of the Rings and uh, the Amazon series, then this is probably a primer for you. If you've read the uh, appendices of Return of the King, this is the next place to go because you've got the story which they're not entirely sticking to, but of how the rings of power are forged. Do you want to say something about the second age and the rings of power and what happens there? Um, yeah. I mean, it's again, like you said, it's in, in the, in the appendices, Lord of the Rings and, you know, they kind of, the prologue to the fellowship of the ring film where you get kind of right again, like that showing what's happening there. Um, but yeah, you, 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 see some of these right the rings how they function um who gets them uh what they do and it's tied in all of this chronologically it's tied to the akalabeth where sauron where we really get him and his involvement so you see how this actually you might think you know why why would people willingly choose these rings to this clearly terrible <laughs> 10 foot tall spiky helmeted person yeah but what you find out earlier is that that's that's not how he looked at the time right during Numenor Sauron actually was one of the most beautiful <laughs> came across he appeared as somebody who was really beautiful was really charismatic uh, and ended up winning people over sweet talking people getting in with politicians slowly actually kind of corrupting their kind of sense of worship, religious worship from Iluvatar, who the humans were worshiping. And the only time you actually get get yeah, mention of an actual reli religion in mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings um, explicitly is in the Akalabeth where humans have you know, kind of a, 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 a holy place where they bring the first fruits of the harvest up to kind of offer to uh, Iluvatar. So he, so anyway, so, so Sauron is kind of corrupting, changing that from worshiping Luvatar to Morgoth, which was Sauron's, you know, uh, commander. Essentially, he was he was Morgoth's, you know, lieutenant, lieutenant, depending on which side of the pond you're on. Um, but they, so he is really strategic, and so you show him kind of distributing these. 
uh, the rings uh, around. So you get you get a better idea of how this would have happened. These weren't just you know idiotic uh, dwarfs or humans. It gives you I think it it helps to nuance it a bit, and you see exactly how it fits in. So that's something that again I think can enrich your reading of Lord of the Rings to understand what's what's at stake there. The way it's arranged actually is a bit confusing for the timeline because in the Rings of Power part, um, Sauron is doing his Tudor meddling, if I'm allowed to use a kind of <laughs> easy to imagine timeline. Um, and it's described how he is not trusted by Galadriel, Gilgalad or Elrond, but Celebrimbor who is the grandson of our favorite Fionnur. So he's, right. got, he's got a troubled background. Um, right. He and he respects this uh, Sauron, who's under another name, for his craftsmanship, because he shows Ella Brimble how to create rings that capture a sort of essence or power. And it's described how, and again, this echoes what you get in the prologue to Lord of the Rings, the film, um, how that when he puts, so he forges the one ring in Mount Doom, hoping to sort of do what his master was trying to do, which is enmesh everybody in his web. But when he puts on the ring, um, the elves who have their three rings, which they made or Celebrimbor made, can understand his desires. And so they hide their rings, which leaves the dwarf rings and the rings for men out there um, sort of vulnerable. And the seven dwarf rings are the foundation of the seven dwarf hordes, like the riches, but they all end horribly, eaten by dragons or whatever. It's not good. Um, and their fate is is kind of slightly, you know, they're not sure what happens to some of them. And then, of course, the rings, the rings for the men um, end up with the, um, the Black Riders. So really not a good trajectory there either. So that comes out of that period there. And he's working out that fate. Um, and there's a battle that happens in the Rings of Power section where um, I'm afraid the, the odds aren't good for the outcome for Celebrimbor. But there is a sort of pushing pushback of Sauron, and then he then takes on the Numenorians, and so that bit comes after. Then, then it weaves back into that section. So, in fact, this is why it's not quite. It doesn't help you the way it's arranged, um, because you then get the end of the Second Age, which again takes us right back to the beginning of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings film. To tell us about that battle. Who's there? Who is the last alliance? Um, so the, basically, that's where all the story threads enmesh is at that point. So Jacob, you can you can tell us in brief. That's good. That's <laughs> no, that, that's, I think that's that's fantastic. And this is another one that I think a good entry point if somebody's daunted by the Silmarillion as a whole to take on it because this is essentially this is an essay, yeah. really summarizing it. So it's not really part of the. Quen it's not part of the Quintus Silmarillion um, proper. And so it's like the Akalabeth, which was kind of a separate story. And this one is essentially an essay that was kind of included at the end. So this one, it, it is, I think it's a fine place to start because you'll be familiar with, with, with kind of what happens there. And it's done so in this kind of higher register of language, you know, it's kind of more epic in tone. So if you finish Lord of the Rings, you could even, I think, easily pick up this essay. It's not, ter it's not terribly long. Um, and just kind of read to get a sense for you could still follow along with what's happening because you have some background information. Uh, it could be a way to kind of ease yourself into the way that uh, Tolkien is telling these stories. Yeah. In the similar area. So the last battle um, of the last alliance, I should say, is where the elves led by Gil Gallard team up with. Um, Elendil and Isildur and others, Elrond's there, um, and they take on Sauron and defeat him. Uh, this moment comes when Isildur cuts the ring, everybody knows where I'm going now, cuts the ring from the hand of Sauron, which enables 
he has foolishly rested, invested so much power in this ring because he was using it as a way of controlling others. And it ends up being the thing that defeats him. And he is defeated for a time. And then the story continues in this essay. And you get really a summary of the events that run up in advance of uh, the Lord of the Rings and also a summary of Lord of the Rings, but seen not from the point of view of the Hobbits, but as if a historian was telling it. So it's quite interesting to see it retold um, at that level. So, for example, you get the uh, the discussions of the council, like Gandalf and his and Saruman and Elrond. You get to see those discussions. Um, and you get the, it's all very summary. It's like a page. Um, so right. in fact, you know, the, the, the end, Return of the King, the right. end is like this. Then Sauron failed and he was utterly vanquished and passed away like a shadow of malice. And the towers of Baradur crumbled in ruin. And at the rumor of their fall, many lands trembled. Thus peace came again and a new spring opened on earth. So it's extremely summary. Um, right. so when even before that, it talks about, right. The mention, I don't know if you have it there, right with you, where it talks about, sure. uh, how it describes Frodo conquering. I think it's just a sentence or two just right before that. Oh yeah. And then it just goes for Frodo, the halfling, it is said at the bidding of Mithrandir took on himself the burden and alone with his servant, he passed through peril and darkness and came at last in Sauron's despite, even to Mount Doom. And there into the fire where it was wrought, he cast the great ring of power. And so at last it was unmade and its evil consumed. There you are. That's the plot of Lord of the, Ring. the Rings. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> I read why, it now. <laughs> why, why read however many hundreds of pages than when you can just have it in a couple sentences there, yeah. right? But it says, right, so you see, like, I, I think it was important you pointed out the perspective, right? So the, the, the Silmarillion, so this is framed as... Um, stories that from elves. So this is kind of the epic yeah. history of the elves told from the elvish perspective. And it comes translated presumably by Bilbo, right? When he hands those you know, volumes to Frodo that he's been working on in Rivendell, uh, translating you know, these from the tales of the elves. This is kind of presumably what Bilbo has been working on translating, kind of compiling this as kind of the meta overarching, you know, kind of like narrative story here. And so this is, everything is from Elvish point of view with their biases, with what they're paying attention to. And so, you know, they don't mention Sam, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and, yeah, and Gandalf is not called Gandalf, he's called Mithrandir, which is their and name Mithrandir, for him. exactly. So you right. uh, look so, at the names, it will tell you whose point of view it is. Yeah. Right. And I think that's helpful for understanding the Silmarillion as a, as a whole, is that this is kind of, whereas Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit are kind of told from a Hobbitish point of view, this one is, the, the Silmarillion is told from an Elvish point of view, so it's in a different register with different scales of time, scopes of time, so that might be helpful for orienting first-time readers. Yeah. So we've reached the end of the text now, except for a couple of family trees, but, you know, that's it, really. So just to recap... Um, you start with the creation story, um, which you've pronounced so beautifully. I'll get you to do that again. Music of the... Dinah Lindale. Thank you. Uh, it was worth bringing you onto the podcast just for that. Uh, <laughs> then you've got the first stage material, which is the Quinta Silmarillion. Uh, and then you've got the, um, the second age material about the downfall of Numenor, the Ancalabeth. And then you've got the second and third age essay, which is of the Rings of Power and the Third Age. Um, you can read all of those separately, um, but we've been sort of signposting you to which ones you might want to start with. So question for you, um, Jacob, which is why is it so difficult to read, do you think? Yeah, I, th I think it's the, the expectations that people have set by Lord of the Rings, right, and how it's you know, the language, the dialogue, right? So it's 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 closer to kind of what you're used to in contemporary novels. Um, whereas, and, and, and I think it's a, a helpful parallel for those uh, familiar with the Christian Bible, with the yeah. Old Testament and New Testament, right? So, right, so people, if you're used to the gospel specifically with the stories of Jesus, they're more fast paced, you have, uh, you know, extended episodes sometimes of like interactions, people talking to each other, 
Um, it's focused on relationships. And sometimes there's casual references to stories of people from the past or quotes, small quotes from stories from the past. Um, that's what Lord of the Rings is. And so if somebody, if all you have is those, those kind of fast moving stories uh, of, of Jesus and the gospels, and you start at the Old Testament with the creation of the world and then a series of genealogies and yeah. then this, you know, histories of, of kings, kings and, and judges and, yeah. and, right, and this, and this, and then the stories that get repeated again. And then, so like that, that's jarring. That's why a lot of Christians don't make it through reading the old Testament. They just stick to the new Testament, but in reading through that background material, everything that's happening there in the gospels uh, is, built upon the foundation these stories these threads these themes that are happening to this people for the past you know a couple few thousand years before so there's very similar parallels in how you know the the old testament new testament are functioning to say the silmarillion uh how that is framed and then the lord of the Rings. so i think that's for 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 a lot of people that i've spoken with they stop because i think they're expecting more of Lord of the Rings in tone and pacing, and they're not getting that. Um, and so it can be frustrating, which is completely understandable, which is completely understandable. So I'm now going to allow you one pick. So these, so listeners are going to give us one chance to get us, you know, into it. If you're coming <laughs> through it from the Lord of the Rings, um, which is the bit that you think would be most interesting for a Lord of the Rings fan to actually have a go at? Yeah, I think so. I think it depends. No, no, I think, I think have just on, one. Well, I'm getting cruel. Well, it's going to be just one. Is, I know. Well, this is what I was going to say. So I think I think my answer is it would, it would depend on what you like most about Lord of the Rings. So if you have like if you like romance and adventure, like the adventure part of Lord of the Rings, if that's what captured you most, then Baron and Luthien story. I think that one would probably most give you the you know the, the same kind of feel of adventure quest you know um unimaginable odds uh you know failure unexpected successes i think baron and luthien for people who for for whom the adventure pull from lord of the rings was there but if you like the right what happens if you like elvish songs and elvish prayers if that if like the elf culture is what what really like fascinates you most than, you know, the, than reading, say, the Ina Lindale and the Valaquenta, the shorter sections at the beginning, that I think will will feed you in the way that you need to be fed that you liked from Lord of the Rings. If you want, if you wish that there was more elves in Lord of the Rings and you just kind of want to sit there and listen to their songs and <laughs> and culture, then I think, yeah, I think the Ina Lindale and Van Valaquenta would do that. But again, if you just like, if you like the dynamics between men and elves, uh, and and their dynamic and like the struggle between those people, then I think yeah, the of men figuring out where they came from, the section uh, of men and the Akalabeth would be great to, and, uh, to start. Yeah, you're breaking the rules because you basically have said. So I gave everything. I was, okay, <laughs> if, I had to, if I had to boil it down, I think I think most I think most people love like the rich world of Lord of the Rings, the adventure as well as the sense of like mythology that like undergirds it. Um, and so I would say Baron, Baron and Luthien would be my final okay, answer. Okay. I had to. <laughs> yeah, you, you go for Baron and Luthien because but... I'm going to go as of today, having sat and reread it, um, is The Voyage of Erendil because I think that has yeah. some really brilliant. Yeah. I mean, you, you'll find out how awful Elrond's childhood was. He gets basically kidnapped. Um, there's a whole kind of. I'd, I'd forgotten about that. He and his brother. So for me, that was. Um, and there's also a real sense of bravery and sacrifice, which foreshadows what Frodo does in what Erendil does. So that's my that's my recommendation. OK, so the, the other sort of poser here, just as we draw things to a close, is um, if you want to understand the Amazon series, where would you go? The Rings of Power. I think that's fairly obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And if you want, and then I would just, if, and if you're ambitious, uh, then the Akalabeth kind of gives you the immediate background there. Cause I think they're going to be, I think there's going to be significant overlap there. Yeah. Um, Cause there is with the, what's happening in the appendices in there. So uh, yeah. So again, that, that essay of the rings of power in the third age, that's an easy place to go to. And if you, 
if yeah, again, if you're feeling ambitious and you want just like a little bit more, just go to the previous chapter and that yeah. should give you more than <laughs> enough information to fill in the gaps and uh, yeah. So um, thank you. That's been hopefully helpful to the people um, who are picking up the Silmarillion and thinking what on earth is going on or what in Arda is going on. Um, yeah. I think it's something I definitely have learned to appreciate and the more you know about something, the more you appreciate mm. the texture and the depth. And so it yeah. may take people a while, but you get there. And um, um, let us know well, what your feelings are. Yeah, and I think I, if, if it's okay, I'd like to, so some, something that helped me in some of my rereads through and getting through it for the first time, because again, it is, in as much, it, I haven't found it helpful when people just say like, well, just be patient and read through it or read through it five times and then you'll understand it. Like that's not really hopeful. I, if I'm not getting it the first time. I can see how that, that's, that's really discouraging. So I mentioned um, last episode that like the biggest thing I think that, that was helpful for me is that I wasn't alone. Um, there are other people who have read this material who have talked about it. So the two resources that I've found, or a few resources, if you just want to go in on your own and read it, um, something that I think is helpful is to, listen along as you're reading to the audiobook by Martin oh. Shaw. Oh, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So that I think that's helpful because like if you're just because sometimes you know you're just sitting there and reading words, like you know, there's some people that if they're they're reading a phone book and it's captivating, like Martin Shaw can do that, right? So his his voice and he's helping and he's pronouncing and his pronunciation sometimes doesn't align well with Tolkien's pronunciation, but he's, you're hearing the words. So I think that can be helpful for people who feel that they're struggling. Just listening to that while you're reading it, I think can be a way to like make it more engaged. That's one thing, if you just want to do it solo, if you really do want to help somebody kind of have, have somebody who can guide you through, there's two, I think for begin, like very, very beginning, um, uh, Dr. Corey Olson, who's you know, nicknamed the, the, the Tolkien professor, um, he has a, he podcasted, he did a survey course uh, at uh, his university on uh, Tolkien, on Tolkien's writings and has nine different class periods uh, that are under an hour each on the Silmarillion. And so this is for an undergraduate audience. So it's very, and he says, you know, says like, hey, here's, here's what you're going to be reading. And so you can read those sections and then listen to the class discussion to get some of the high level talking about some of those um, topics uh, through that. So nine, nine episodes, so that's, you know, less, less than nine hours that you can stop. And that was helpful for me was stopping after I'd read a section and then reading something about it, kind of re-familiarizing myself, recontextualizing myself with somebody else to kind of help refresh it and make sure that I understood what was happening. Cause it's a lot of information and, it's, and it can, it can be overwhelming for first time readers. For those first time readers who are more ambitious um, or you're going through for a second time for some of the audience will be will be rereading the Silmarillion. I highly recommend the Prancing Ponies uh, podcast. Um, and they have almost 50 episodes where they're looking, you know, chapter by chapter, having hour and a half uh, kind of conversations where they're bringing in, they're not just not only kind of situating it in context of Lord of the Rings, but also they're bringing in some additional material from Unfinished Tales uh, and from the history of Middle Earth. So they're really doing yeah. some really, really important, I think, um, and thorough discussion. So first time readers, I think wetting your feet, I think going along with this undergraduate class over nine periods that it's that that's manageable and would be helpful to just kind of give you encouragement and help you understand, keep you keep you on track to, to finish. But then for those people either who want more uh, and for people who are rereading the Silmarillion and the Prancing Pony uh, podcast going along through stopping after you've read those sections, listen to those. I did that for my second to last read through and found it really, really, really helpful um, and entertaining as well. And of course, what we're doing here in our readathon is just doing the encouragement of reading with others. Because um, right. I think one of the you don't obviously have to listen to any of these extra materials to to give your first thoughts on right. the Silmarillion. We're not about um, we're about creativity and what it what it inspires you to imagine and think. So these are don't feel that you have to have a PhD in the Silmarillion before you want to to read a chapter. We just wanted to give you access to these resources which have helped us. Right. So before we finish. Um, Jacob, we always have a where in all the fantasy worlds is the best place for something. 
And I was humming and hurrying about themes in the Silmarillion. And I decided one which I hadn't touched on before is exile. Because in fact, the elves are in exile. Uh, the ones that we meet in Middle Earth. Uh, well, the Galadriel type elves. And I was thinking, where in all the fantasy worlds is the best place to be in exile? Because you get that hankering from the country you came from, but that may not be quite what you want um, because you're also in love with the place you have arrived at. So have you got any fantasy worlds where you've thought about the theme of exile? Yeah, and looking, and that's, and it was, it was a diff difficult question, mm. uh, trying to think of good, uh, I mean, I don't know if uh, the, the world of, you know, pre-renaissance uh italy is considered a fantasy location but right da dante was famously in exile when he had the space to to write and create uh right the divine comedy uh essentially so b barring an actual real world location and exile um like that I, this and this this I, I i recognize how this might sound but i think um I think Earth, I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe Earth uh, is the best place to go into exile, like Thor, right? Thinking of, yes. of Thor. What a good gets pick. exiled yeah. right, from Asgard. And then he, like you said, like, you know, he, he's longing for home, but then like learns more about himself uh, as, as he comes to love the, the world of, of, of humans and uh, ultimately makes him better and has all sorts of rollicking adventures uh, with other with other heroes uh, at the time. So, and it doesn't seem like you have whole scale. It seems like there'd be a lot more people dying there. Um, but I think because it's owned by Disney, you don't have the wholesale like carnage and slaughter that would probably mm. actually happen in our world <laughs> if you had these powers. So, because of that, because it's a little bit safer for pedestrians. Uh, in in the in in the world, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I think that's that's where I would choose to go into exile, especially if I was a son of uh, Odin. Yeah, good pick. That's a good pick. I hadn't thought of that one. Um, it's actually the whole theme of it, of exile. If you're a creative and thinking about fantasy, is a really fascinating one. It's a bit different from a theme we tend to associate with fantasy. And I was thinking it's very common in fairy tales. And actually, um, particularly the heroine's journey is very often an exile from a home. Um, so picking on a fairy tale character, when, when I've said that, you can now think, oh, yeah, the Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and uh, Cinderella. And, you know, you see all these people who are being sort of made homeless or not welcome in their own home, that, that form of exile. So of all of those fairy tale versions, I think probably the best place to go into exile is to join the dwarves in their house. Uh, that looks quite jolly and uh, yeah, for lots of company. So she has one of the better exiles, um, does um, Snow White. So that's my going into exile. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for talking and spending so much time talking about this. And I hope that um, those who are listening will find this helpful. We will put the link to the resources that Jacob mentioned in our show notes. And uh, do join in our readathon. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>